Brutus number one, October 18th, 1787. Brutus number one, October 18th, 1787. To the citizens of the state of New York. When the public is called to investigate and decide upon a question in which not only the present members of the community are deeply interested, but upon which the happiness and misery of generations yet unborn is in great measure suspended, the benevolent mind cannot help feeling itself peculiarly interested in the result. Peculiarly. In this situation, I trust the feeble efforts of an individual to lead the minds of the people to a wise and prudent determination cannot fail of being acceptable to the candid and dispassionate part of the community. Encouraged by this consideration, I have been induced to offer my thoughts upon the present important crisis in our political affairs. Perhaps this country never saw so critical a period in their political concerns, we have felt the feebleness of the ties by which these United States are held together. The want of sufficient energy in our present confederation to manage, in some instances, our general concerns. Various expediments, expediments have been proposed to remedy these evils, but none have succeeded. At length, the convention of the states have has been assembled. They have formed a constitution, which will now probably be submitted to the people to ratify or reject, who are the fountain of all power, to whom alone it of right belongs to make or unmake constitutions or forms of government at their pleasure. The most important question that was ever proposed to your decision or to the decision of any people under heaven is before you, and you are to decide upon it by men of your own election chosen specially. For this purpose, if the Constitution offered to your acceptance be a wise one calculated to preserve the invaluable blessings of liberty to secure the inestimable, inestimable rights of mankind and promote human happiness, then if you accept it, you will lay a lasting foundation of happiness for millions yet unborn. Generations to come will rise up and call you blessed. You may rejoice and the prospects of this vast extended continent becoming filled with free men who will assert the dignity of human nature. You may solace, 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 solace yourself with the idea that society in this favored land will fast advance to the highest point of perfection. The human mind will expand in knowledge and virtue and the golden age be in some measure realized but if on the other hand this form of government contains principles that will lead to the subversion of liberty if it tends to establish a despotism or what is worse a tyrannic aristocracy then if you adopt it this only remaining asylum for liberty will be shut up and posterity will execrate your memory momentous then is the question you have to determine you are called upon by every motive which should influence a noble and virtuous mind to examine it well and to make up a wise judgment. It is insisted indeed that this constitution must be received, be it ever so imperfect. If it has its defects, it is said, they can be best amended when they are experienced. But remember, when the people once part with power, they can seldom or never resume it again but by force. Many instances can be produced in which the people have voluntarily increased the powers of their rulers, but few, if any, in which rulers have willingly abridged their authority. This is a sufficient reason to induce you to be careful in the first instance how you deposit the powers of government. With these few introductory remarks, I shall proceed to a consideration of this Constitution. The first question that presents itself on the subject is whether a confederated government be the best for the United States or not, or in other words, whether the 13 United States should be reduced to one great republic governed by one legislature and under the direction of one executive and judicial, and whether they should continue 13 confederated republics under the direction and control of a supreme federal head for certain defined national purposes only. This inquiry is important because although the government reported by the convention does not go to a perfect and entire cons consolidation yet it approaches so near to it that it must if executed certainly and infallibly terminate in it 
This government is to possess absolute and uncontrollable power, legislative, executive, and judicial, with respect to every object to which it extends for by the last clause of Section 8th, Article 1st, it is declared that the Congress shall have power to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers and all other powers vested by this Constitution in the government of the United States or in any department or office thereof. And by the sixth article, it is declared that this Constitution and the laws of the United States, which shall be made in pursuance thereof, and the treaties made or which shall be made under the authority of the United States, shall be the supreme law of the land, and the judges in every state shall be bound thereby in anything in the Constitution or law of any state to the contrary, notwithstanding it appears from these articles that there is no need of any intervention of the state governments between the Congress and the people to execute one, to execute any one power vested in the general government and that the constitution and laws of every state are nullified and declared void so far as they are or shall be inconsistent with this constitution or the laws made in pursuance of it or with treaties made under the authority of the United States, the government then, so far as it extends, is a complete one, not a confederation. It is as much one complete government as that of New York or Massachusetts has as absolute and perfect powers to make and execute all laws, to appoint officers, institute courts, declare offenses, and annex penalties. With respect to every object to which it extends as any other in the world so far therefore as its powers reach all ideas of confederation are given up and lost it is true this government is limited to certain objects or to speak more properly some small degree of power is still left to the states but a little attention to the powers vested in the general government will convince every candid man that if it is capable of being executed all that is reserved for the individual states must very soon be annihilated except so far as they are barely necessary to the organization of the general government the powers of the general legislature extend to every case that is of the least importance there is nothing valuable to human nature nothing dear to free men but what is within its power it has authority to make laws which will affect the lives, the liberty, and property of every man in the United States, nor can the Constitution or laws of any state or in any way prevent or impede the full and complete execution of every power given the legislative power is competent to lay taxes, duties, imposts, and excises. There's no limitation to this power unless it be said that the clause which directs the use to which those taxes and duties shall be applied may be said to be a limitation, but this is no restriction of the power at all. For by this clause they are to be applied to pay the debts and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States. But the legislature have authority to contract debts at their discretion. They are the sole judges of what is necessary to provide for the common defense, and they only are to determine what is for the general welfare. This power, therefore, is neither more nor less than a power to lay and collect taxes, imposts, and excises at their pleasure. Not only is the power to lay taxes unlimited as to the amount they may require, but it is perfect and absolute to raise them in any mode they please. No state legislature or any power in the state governments have any more to do in carrying this into effect than the authority of one state has to do with that of another. With that of another in the business, therefore, of laying and collecting taxes, the idea of confederation is totally lost, and that of one entire republic is embraced. It is proper here to remark that the authority to lay and collect taxes is the most important of any power that can be granted. It connects with it almost all other powers, or at least will in process of time draw all other after it. It is the great means of protection, security, and defense in a good Government and the great engine of oppression and tyranny in a bad one. And a good government and the great engine of oppression and tyranny in a bad one. This cannot fail of being the case if we consider the contracted limits which are set by this constitution to the late, to the state governments on this article of raising money. No state can emit paper money 
lay any duties or imposts on imports or exports, but by consent of the Congress. And then the net produce shall be for the benefit of the United States, the only mean, therefore, left for any state to support its government and discharge its debts is by direct taxation in the United States have also power to lay and collect taxes in any way they please. Everyone who has thought on the subject must be convinced that but small sums of money must be convinced that but small sums of money can be collected in any country by direct taxes. When the federal government begins to exercise the right of taxation in all its parts, the legislatures of the several states will find it impossible to raise monies to support their governments without money they cannot be supported, then they must dwindle away. And they must dwindle away. And as before observed, the powers absorbed in that of the general government, it might be here shown that the power in the federal legislative to raise and support armies at pleasure, as well in peace as in war, and their control over the militia tend not only to a consolidation of the government, but the destruction of liberty, I shall not, however, dwell upon these as a few observations upon the judicial power of this government in addition to the proceeding will fully evince the truth of the position. The judicial power of the United States is to be vested in a Supreme Court and in such inferior courts as Congress may from time to time ordain and establish. The powers of these courts are very extensive. Their jurisdiction comprehends all civil causes except such as arise between citizens of the same state. And it extends to all cases in law and equity arising under the Constitution. One inferior court must be established, I presume, in each state, at least with the necessary executive officers appendant thereto. It is easy to see that in the common course of things, these courts will eclipse the dignity and take away from the respectability of the state courts, these courts will be in themselves totally independent of the states deriving their authority from the United States and receiving from them fixed salaries. And in the course of human events, it is to be expected that they will swallow up all the powers of the courts in the respective states. How far the clause in the eighth section of the first article may operate to do away all idea of confederated states and to effect an entire consolidation of the whole into one general government is impossible to say. It is impossible to say the powers given by this article are very general and comprehensive and it may receive a construction to justify the passing almost any law. A power to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution all powers vested by the Constitution in the government of the United States or any department or officer thereof is a power very comprehensive and definite, indefinite and may, for all I know, be exercised in such manner as entirely to abolish the state legislature. Suppose the legislature of a state should pass a law to raise money to support their government and pay the state debt. May the Congress repeal this law because it may prevent the collection of a tax which they may think proper and necessary to lay to provide for the general welfare of the United States for all laws made in pursuance of this Constitution or the supreme law of the land and the judges in every state shall be bound thereby anything in the Constitution or laws of the different states to the contrary notwithstanding. By such a law, the government of a particular state might be overturned at one stroke and thereby be deprived of every means of its support Just going to cut it off right there. Support. And thereby deprived. Thereby be deprived of every means of its support. That's part one. We'll get to part two coming up.